Howdy, it's uh, time for the Street Preachers Catechism class. We are studying the um, Westminster Larger Catechism, if you've not um, been to our class before. And we are up to uh, question and answer number 70. We have been looking at the uh, mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only mediator and the only saviour of sinners and uh, what he came to do and who he came to do it for. And um, how, of course, people, men and women, such as you and I, are made partakers of his mediation work. How that is that we are reconciled to God, brought back to God, and to a knowledge experience of his grace, mercy, love and pity that God has shown manifest in his um, producing and providing us with a mediator. One that is to fetch us back to God, to reconcile us to him, to do for us that which we are unable to do ourselves. Because without Jesus, without the Son of God, we are lost, we are cut off from God, not just in time, but for all eternity, unless that is, um, we are um, reconciled. So uh, the state, the condition of men and women uh, conceived in sin, born in sin, as we have seen, and um, living in sin, objects of God's wrath and hatred, objects of um, God's eternal wrath, unless that is God himself, by an act of his own free grace, intervenes and brings us to a knowledge of his grace, love, mercy and pity. Through Jesus Christ, his son, in a word, justifies us, unless God himself justifies us freely. And that brings us to our question for today. The catechist, he asks the question, what is justification? What does it mean for a person to be justified and why is it that they need justifying? Well, I've answered that already in part. But the catechist, he answers the question this way. He says, justification is an act of God's free grace. Notice, will you? An act of God, an act of God's free grace, not an act of man's, not an act of yours, an act of God's free grace unto sinners, in which he pardoneth all their sins, accepteth and accounteth their persons righteous in his sight, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but only for the perfect obedience and full satisfaction of Christ by God imputed to them and received by faith alone. Justification. The meaning of justification. It's a legal term. To justify someone or to justify something is to make that thing or person right. And we need justifying. We may need make it, making right because we are not right. Not right with God, that is. The very opposite. Because of Adam's sin. Through natural generation, sin is passed on through the generations so that we are sinners by nature. We receive those natures from our parents all the way back to Adam. So we are sinners by nature and because we are sinners by nature, we are sinners by practice too. We have offended God, offended his love, offended, uh, broken his law, covenant breakers to a man, to a woman, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. Here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Only through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus can we be made right with God. Brought into a right standing with God, that is. Justified. Justified. 
justified freely by God's grace. It's a gift of God, you see. It's a legal term declaring a person to be judicially righteous before God. Righteous. Um, righteous, that is, not because of anything you do, not because of anything in you, but righteous because of another, because um, the righteousness of God has been reckoned to your account. So it's a legal term to justify, to declare. When a person believes in Jesus, God the Father, if you like, uh, dons the judge's cap, brings down the gavel, and declares it's a judicial declaration, a legal declaration, you see. And God declares that sinner not just to be not guilty, that's not enough, but declares that person to be righteous, perfectly righteous, justifies them. But it's an act. As the Catechist says, it's an act of God's free grace unto sinners. It's something that God does sovereignly, freely. It's an act of his grace and of his love for those whom he has chosen before the foundation of the world, his elect. And because of this, you see, their sin is freely pardoned, whatever their sin might have been. However much they have sinned and whatever kind of sin they've been involved in, their sin is freely pardoned without cost, without price. It's the prophet's invitation in the Old Testament to come buy bread without money. The bread of life, that is. The living bread. Jesus, the only mediator. The one who alone can give you life. Sin freely pardoned and cancelled, cancelled for the sake of and by Christ's atoning blood on the cross which takes us back you see to the mediator's work his humbling himself unto death the death of the cross taking upon himself the form of a servant emptying himself uh, veiling his glory uh, coming into this world as a man in human nature and in that nature still yet God going to that cross, dying, shedding his blood in order that sinners might be washed and cleansed and, and pardoned, freely pardoned. The free gift of God, the wages of, of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, you see, forgiveness is wonderful. The heart of the gospel, that there is forgiveness with God, that he may be feared, says the psalmist. Forgiveness is an essential. We need God's forgiveness, no doubt about that. But we need more than forgiveness. That's not enough. That's not enough. That wouldn't get you to heaven. That wouldn't get you into a right standing with God. We need a positive and we need a perfect righteousness. God needs to be able to look upon us as if we had never sinned. How can he possibly do that? Because you have sinned. We have all sinned. As the Bible says, Romans 3.23 again, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So how? And even, even as Christians, we continue to sin and will do to the end of our course, the end of our lives. So how can God possibly look on any man, any woman, as if they had never sinned? Well, when he reckons to them, when he credits to them, to their account, undeservedly, without favour, yeah, without any them having done anything to earn it, deserve it, in any way whatsoever, God accounts, God reckons to their account a righteousness that's not their own. Hence you see the work of Jesus, humiliation. His coming, you see, made of the woman, made under the law, and what else? Living, his life. His life subjecting himself humbly uh, 
the great, the mighty God, the second person of the blessed and holy trinity, Jesus Christ, stepped down into this world and lived perfectly, perfectly in subjection to the law of God. Perfectly. Every aspect of God's law, the moral code, the civil code, the ceremonial code, nothing left undone. He kept it to the utmost, perfect, a life that displayed perfect righteousness. That life of Jesus Christ, that righteousness of Jesus Christ is attributed to, is reckoned to the account of the sinner who truly, actively believes in, trusts in Jesus Christ. So not just forgiven, not just forgiven, that's not enough. Lovely, wonderful, it's the most wonderful thing I tell you, experience in all the world to come to know, to understand, to grasp, to get it, that for the sake of Jesus Christ, you've been forgiven. Everything that you ever did, all forgiven. Your sins, past, present and future, all dealt with, all the guilt taken away by the blood of God's Son, Jesus Christ. But more than that, more than that, made righteous, made righteous. Christ has made unto you righteousness when you believe in Jesus, only when you believe in Jesus. And God looks on that sinner, looks on that trusting individual as if he or she had never, ever sinned in all their lives. Amazing. Amazing. That's the grace of God. Sovereign, free grace of God. That he communicates to his elect. So it's as if um, God looks on that sinner, because God's command is for all men, yeah, without exception, whether you believe in God or not, yeah. God's command is that we should obey him. That is that we should love him. That's the one demand that God makes of human beings, that we love him with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And there's none of us done that. That's what sin is, not loving God. Because if you love God, you would obey God. Yeah, that's the bottom line. That, that's no, no love for God. And he no love for you, because you have offended his love. You do not love him. Have not loved him. None of us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But now, having been justified freely by the grace of God, and God looks upon us as being perfectly righteous, never having sinned, he looks upon that sinner like as if they had loved God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind all their lives long. Yeah. And, and having loved their neighbor as themselves, the second table of God's law. But without this righteousness, without being justified, without being made righteous by faith, by the grace of God through faith in Christ, there's no heaven. Without righteousness, you'll never see heaven, you'll never see the inside of heaven. When you die, you you remain in that state of death in which you were conceived and born. You came into the world in a state of existence, not knowing life. You don't live until you come to partake of the bread of life. And what is death? Death is to be in a state of, um, is to be a, an object of divine wrath, separated from God. And that condition, that state, will carry on for all eternity. Unless by the grace of God, a free, an act of God's free grace, intervening and justifying you by faith in Jesus Christ and making you live. Making you live. Forgiving, pardoning all your sins for the sake of Jesus Christ and his atoning blood, your guilt, your sin, all of it, cancelled 
and given a righteousness, the righteousness of God that's revealed in Jesus Christ alone, that righteousness. When you stand before God in that day, and you will, we all will, you need to be found trusting in another righteousness apart from your own. An alien righteousness, one that belongs to another, God's righteousness. And that righteousness is communicated, is reckoned to a man or woman's account when they believe truly and actively believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But the door will be closed to you. You stand before God in that day and you're in the filthy rags of your own righteousness, then the door to heaven is shut tight, watertight. Yeah, No entrance, no way into heaven unless you are righteous, unless God looks upon you as if you had never sinned, unless God looks upon you today as if you had loved him with all your heart, soul, strength and mind all your days. No heaven because no righteousness. Righteousness is a requirement. God has provided the necessary righteousness. When you take Jesus when you take the bread of life, when you partake of the bread of life, he says to you, come and eat. When you come and eat, when you come and dine, then God reckons his righteousness to you, to your account. You're home free. You're bound for heaven. In justifying, he accepts, God accepts the person rejected before that, a reject, yeah, not acceptable to God, separated, alienated from God because of your iniquities, your lawless deeds, the prophet says. But in justifying, it's an act of God, remember, an act of God's grace, not yours, not mine. It's an act of God's free grace. When he justifies the sinner, he accepts their persons, and he accounts their persons as being utterly, altogether righteous. That's the free grace of God. That's the meaning of justification. That's what God does in justifying sinners. And that's what he does in the gospel. And that's what he does in the preaching of the gospel. And why men and women need to hear the gospel. Why we need to preach the gospel. Why I'm preaching it today, every day. Every occasion I possibly can because men and women are alienated from God, cut off from God. And the only way that they can be reconciled to God is if God justifies them How by my gospel that I'm preaching to you today. And that gospel needs to be preached because there's no other way of reconciling sinners. Yeah. Can't be saved without the gospel. How can they hear... How can they believe if, if, without a preacher? And if the preacher isn't sent, if the preacher doesn't go and tell them, we need preachers, gospel preachers. And men and women need to hear the gospel. They need to hear clearly and distinctly what it is that they are. Damn are they sinners. Cut off from the love of God. Separated from God. Unrighteous, unholy, ungodly. And not knowing it until he until they hear the gospel clearly and distinctly proclaim that they are damn worthy sinners and in desperate need of Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And that's a far cry, I tell you, from uh, uneducated, ignorant Christians going about the world telling everybody all on a Sunday that God loves them. That will not do. That will not do. They are not doing you any favour, none whatsoever. But the basis of this righteousness, well, is the righteousness of Christ. It's not on the basis of, like I say, something you've done or something in you. You know, because you're a religious person or something, or because you go to church, you say your prayers, you read the Bible, etc., etc. No. It's the righteousness of Christ. It's the righteousness of another. 
check out 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you will, verse uh, 30. Uh, God himself has made, this is the Christian, has made Christ to be our righteousness. He, Christ, in giving Christ to us, he gives us his righteousness, the righteousness of God, his perfect obedience, which I've already explained to you. His subjection to God's law, fulfilling every aspect of God's law, but not only that, going to the cross and satisfying the divine justice that has been offended. Satisfying, making satisfaction for our sins that we have committed. God's justice has to be satisfied. And it was the death, the sacrifice of his only begotten son on the cross was like sweet incense, you know, rising up to heaven, a, a sweet, sweet aroma in the nostrils of God, his father, acceptable, pleasant to God, satisfying his wrath, taking it away from off of the sinner. By the death of his son Jesus Christ. How do I know? How do I know it was a, a sweet aroma to God? How do I know it was acceptable to God? Because of his resurrection. Because God raised him from the dead. Because he's alive and alive forevermore. His perfect, perfect obedience and the full satisfaction that he has made, Jesus Christ has made, he's paid the price because you can't pay it. You can atone for your sins, no matter how good you try to be, no matter how religious you try to be, no matter how diligent you try to be in your religion. And there are many, many such people in this world who are very, very religious and very careful and very diligent about their religion. Jews and Muslims and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and you name it. Nice people, kind people, some of them, but cut off from God, cut off from God. The obedience of Jesus Christ and the satisfaction that he made through his death on the cross, all that is reckoned to the man or woman who truly believes in Jesus, who trusts in him, in the work of another not the work of their own hands. Roman Catholic Church will tell you, faith plus works, plus your good works. You can partly earn your way to heaven. That's damnable heresy. And then we've got what we call the federal visionists. You have them in the United States of America mainly. There are one or two here. And we have the... Um, Mr. N.T. Wright with his same damnable heresy here, a very popular man, uh, his books sell very, very well. He's a heretic and the heresy that he um, dispenses uh, throughout the world along with the Roman Catholic Church and the Federal Visionists is this, salvation by faith and works knows his God, faith and faith alone. The catechist, remember, uh, but only for the perfect obedience and full satisfaction of Christ by God imputed to them. And here's the, here's the operating um, operative factor, the last words, and received by faith alone, apart from any works cannot work your way back to God or into a covenant of friendship with God only by faith. So the basis is Christ, his obedience, his satisfaction that he has made, his sufferings, his death cancels out our guilt, takes it clean away. Because Christ not only died, but he lived 
and he lived perfectly for every one of those whom he died for, his elect. He shall, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But then there are, I've already touched on it, but we need to work on this. Yeah, it's so important. You need to understand this. If you're to get right with God, if you're to be justified. The false basis, and there are some false basis for justification. Any work in us, yeah? Reformation of character. Well, if I, you know, I'll get my act together, you see. You know, I, I'll tidy myself up and then do this, you know? Some people hear the gospel and, you know, they've been living in, in profanity, they've been living in disgraceful sins and, and, and maybe to some degree, you know, it affects them, it, it convicts them, it, um, you know, it, it, it brings them to, you know, make some, some reform to their lives, you know, maybe a drunkard, for instance, um, will be scared out of his wits and, and he'll give up drinking and you think, Maybe he thinks he's okay, you know, or um, or maybe some people would even become religious, you know, maybe even even start going to church. But you know, um, coming away from the drink, you know, and going to a church. Well, there's nothing wrong with going to a good Bible-believing church. That doesn't make you righteous, you know. You can reform your character all you want. But your heart is still diseased. Your your heart is still deceitful and desperately wicked. You're even deceiving your own selves. You know when the Bible says that the heart is deceitful, you know, it, it is to this extent, you know, that we're deceived by others. We're deceived by the anti rights, the, the Roman Catholic Church and, and many others. We're deceived by that which is false evolutionism and all the rest of it but because we've got deceitful hearts we deceive our own selves you know we 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 we, we kid ourselves on that we can we can make ourselves righteous i can do this myself thank you very much nice to hear this from you mr gospel preacher but you know yeah i, I hear what you're saying and i need to tidy up my act a little bit you know, I need to be more diligent in my church attendance and, and, and so on. But I can do this my own. Thank you, Mr. Preacher. I don't need you. I can be as good as any Christian in any church. No, you can't. No, you can't. That's a false basis for justification. Any reformation that you can make is not enough. God must, by an act of his free grace, he must justify you. He does that. He does that sovereignly and freely. And of course, um, you know that, well, Jesus puts it in this way. He says you must be born again. Because you see, until a man is born again, you see, this is why people deceive themselves. This is why people seek to reform themselves, you know, thinking that will make them good enough. Because they've never been reborn. Because the Holy Spirit has never regenerated them. Because in regeneration, you see, in causing us to be born again, the Holy Spirit illuminates our minds. We're able to see, we're able to perceive, we're able to understand, not just the kingdom of God, but we're able to understand for the first time in our lives what it is that we actually are, how sinful we are. Yeah? Oh no, God doesn't reveal the full extent of our sin when we come first to know him when we're regenerated. If he did that, it would crush us beyond belief. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't take that. But he brings us to see, he brings us to understand that we are sinful, that we are cut off from God, that we are ex unacceptable to him without Jesus Christ as son. But only the Holy Spirit, you see, I haven't got that power. I can tell you about your sin. I can tell you what the Bible says about your sin. But until you hear the voice of the Son of God, you will never live. 
and without the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, you will never come to see yourself as you truly, really are, sinful to the uttermost. And under the wrath of God, the displeasure of God, the hatred of God, and in need of God's grace, mercy, and pity in his Son, Jesus Christ. That you might be justified by God's act of free grace. Not something you do, anybody does. You or I. Only God. Only God. So reformation, becoming religious, religiosity as I call it, church attendance, a good thing but not the basis of righteousness justification only christ yeah not being good trying to be good or anything else but don't you know haven't you haven't you experienced this in your life at some point that you know that um the more you try to be good the worse it becomes yeah because we're incapable we're in impotent it's not possible because we're sinners by nature it's, in, it's our, in our nature, it's in our DNA, yeah? comes out of every, every pore, you know, of your being. Until God, you know, deals with it finally and fully and only through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and justifies you freely by his blood. So anything done by us, works of any kind whatsoever unacceptable to God the only good works that are acceptable to God are those done by believers again Romans 3 check it out for yourself none good says God and none that doeth good none righteous says God not even one not even one so anything done by us any works at all of any kind unacceptable to God the only good works that are acceptable to God are those are those done by true believers and done in faith that which is not of faith is sin so any works that you may have maybe you go about feeding the poor a good thing to do don't stop maybe you help old ladies across the street good thing to do don't stop you may do many many good things but they're not good from your perspective I mean but they're not good from God's perspective unless they're done through faith in his son Jesus Christ totally unacceptable your person your being your works everything about you unacceptable cut off separated from God until you are justified freely by his grace through his son Jesus Christ and faith in his name then and then only will you have the ability to do any good works which you must do which you must do so there's no salvation by any human endeavor none whatsoever none at all only faith faith in the son of god that's why the bible says again and again believe in the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved why jesus calls read the gospel narratives for yourself matthew mark luke and john read and see how that jesus again and again calls men and women to the same and the one thing each and every time whatever their state or condition might be faith only believe because faith in Christ alone fetches the righteousness of God alone and fetches and fetches to us a true basis for justification Christ Jesus the Son of God righteousness is imputed it's reckoned to us that is to our account it's credited to the sinner's account picture it this way you've got a bank book and here on the left hand page the writing's all in red you're in debt up to your eyeballs 
And as you look at it, you ponder it, you meditate upon it, you reckon that you will never, ever be free of any debt. Never pay it off. More than you could ever pay. Millions upon millions upon millions and your heart sinks in despair. Now transfer that to the spiritual realm. That's your sin. All in red. All dead. A debt that you cannot pay. You try to pay it yourself, Jesus says, you will be in jail for all eternity until you pay the last farthing. That is to say, you can never pay the debt. But the moment that the sinner believes in Jesus, trusts in Jesus, and is justified by an act of free grace, all that red ink disappears, and over on the other side, is all credit, is all in blue ink. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification and redemption. All yours. Not because you did anything, not because you paid the debt off, not because you even tried to pay it off, not because you rubbed out the red ink, but simply God bestowing his love his grace, his favour, undeserved favour, his um, grace, mercy, pity and kindness upon you for the sake of his son Jesus Christ. Credited to your account. Yeah? You opened up your spiritual bank book one morning and you discovered that all the debt was gone. And you are in credit. Yeah? You're not just in credit. You are super rich. You are super rich. You might not have any money in the bank. You might even be homeless. Yeah? Living on the streets. But you are richer than any king, any prince in this world. Because you've got God. You've got Christ. You've got eternal, you've got everlasting life. You've got the glory, all the glory and riches of heaven belong to you. Super rich. By an act of God's free grace. Justifying you. Making you right with himself. Yeah. So faith, you see, um, understand this too, will you please? Faith is not a work. Okay? Error, you know, place where some people go astray, you know. It's, well, I have believed, oh, pat myself in the head, what a good person I am. No, no, no. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace you are saved, through faith that not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. It's the gift of God. Faith, I mean. But faith itself, you see, it is neither the basis of our justification. Faith is simply and only the hand that reaches out and receives the basis of our justification. Faith is an instrument, not the means of our justification, or getting right with God. Faith is the instrument that receives the righteousness of God set before you in the gospel and set before you here today, this afternoon, in the preaching of the gospel. You reach out the hand of faith and you take Jesus and you are freely justified by an act of God's free grace. Justified by faith on the basis of the person of Christ and the work of Jesus Christ alone, nothing else, no other. Again, the catechist, um, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but only for the perfect obedience and full satisfaction of Christ by God imputed to them and received by faith alone, no other way. So you see, when you realize and you begin to grasp, understand what it is that you are, 
without Christ, I mean. What it is that you are before God, the reality of that, of your state and condition, and what it is that you dare deserve, what we all deserve. And you begin to read the gospel and you begin to see what the mighty Son of God has done in humbling himself unto death, dying and rising again, living that life of obedience, that perfection of righteousness. Um, and you begin to see, but only by faith, you begin to see the glory the wonderful glory of the Son of God, the God-man who came into this world to save sinners, wretched sinners like you and I. And when you see that through the eye of faith, Jesus says in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, check it out, he says there to his father, he says that um, he would that his people would behold his glory that they would be with him where he is, that's in heaven, and that they would behold his glory in heaven. Well, I have to tell you, you will never see that. You will never behold his glory in heaven unless you behold his glory now, now in this world, through faith that is. See the wonder, the wonder of God's grace and love and kindness towards sinners in producing and providing for them a righteousness through his glorious Son, Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father. But when you see, when you see, I tell you, when you see by faith, when you see the glories of the Son of God, it will scatter all your fears. Yeah? Nothing left to fear. Nothing left to fear. When you're justified, when you're right with God, not, there, there's nothing left to fear, viruses or anything else. You have eternal life. All your doubts, all your objections, all your arguments about God and the things of God pertaining to God will all go. Your depressions, your poverty of spirit, um, your temptations and trials, and even for believers, an anchor, an anchor for their souls that holds them firm in the midst of all the trials, temptations, all the storms in both life and death. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. I am life, says Jesus. What is the opposite to life? It's death. What is death? It's sin's wages. The wages of sin is death. What is death? Death is to be separated from God. Death is to be an object of God's wrath. Now in time, but to be so for all eternity without life. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. You partake of him. You come to God's table and dine and partake of, you eat the bread of life. But if you don't eat the bread, talking in physical terms, if you don't eat the bread, it will never nourish you. It won't nourish, it won't feed your life. Spiritually speaking, if you don't dine upon, if you don't partake of, if you don't eat the bread of life, Jesus, you will not see life. You will never know life. Cut off from God for all eternity. We don't wish that for you. I do not wish that for you. It's why we preach the gospel. It's why we bring these things to your attention. That you might eat and live. That you might come to the bread of life. The true bread. The bread that came down from heaven, sent of his Father into the world to be a mediator, a means by which you could be reconciled to God by an act of God's free grace. And how does he do that? He does that by the preaching of the gospel, causing men and women whom he 
wills to be justified, to be reconciled to himself, causing them to hear the gospel and hearing the gospel by his spirit in conjunction with his word, he brings them to see. He brings them to perceive, understand. He transforms them within and he gives them the ability. He gives them the desire. He gives them the longing. He gives them the will to come to and put their trust in Jesus Christ, who is the righteousness of God. And in believing and trusting in him, reclining upon Jesus, resting in Jesus, and in all that he has done in his glorious person and works. That that person, that you be reconciled to God, made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin, Jesus, he knew no sin, made sin for us. Sin was laid upon him on that cross in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in him and received by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. I commend him to you. Trust in him, believe in him, and you shall indeed you shall indeed be saved. He will not cast you away. Turn to him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. God bless you, go with you and hopefully, Lord willing, see you tomorrow.